At the beginning of every church year, uh, or, you know, year, the, what a minister, what a pastor, what a leader should do is come and say, this is the vision for our year. That's what we should do. And um, I've long believed that actually the danger with that is we essentially have it's, it's about what we do or what we think God's going to do for us. I'm convinced, really, that at the beginning of moments like this, then what we're better placed to do is come and say, what are, what are the promises that God has given us that we can respond to? In other words, whatever happens this year, it's not really all on your shoulders. It's not about how good you are for God. It's not about how active you are for him. It's not even really how obedient you are in all truth. It's about his faithfulness to us. Where he stays faithful even when we are faithless. He has promised to walk with us. And I don't know, but I think some of you have found this over the years. It's really difficult to shake God off. You know? There's times when through many of our lives we just say, do you know what, I think I'll put it on the back burner. But God will not be put on the back burner because he loves you too much. He loves you too much. And the promises of God that he will be with us, that he is for us, that he will be walking out uh, our lives alongside us. This wonderful phrase, a three mile an hour God, because that's the pace at which most of us walk. This idea of the spirit who will fill you, the spirit who will nudge you and guide you. These are the promises that God has given his people through all generations. So at the beginning of a year, what's the best thing to to say? Well, in a sense, we prayed it, Lord, be magnified in my life. May you get bigger. While we were singing, uh, Beth uh, sent me a, a text. While we were singing, I, I was reminded during worship when John the Baptist says, he must become greater, I must become less. I felt that some of us may be feeling weak or powerless, and that's fine as long as we're giving God space to be greater in our lives. It's this idea of being in a context where we go, God, would you just do more? And I want to know you better. I just want to know you better. This year, you may well have your plans. You may well have got a calendar and put stuff on the calendar about what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. You might already have been thinking, I wonder when we're going to go on holiday. But this year as all years, will not be marked by the things you've planned, but it'll be the things that you couldn't plan for. That's what you'll remember this year for. The stuff that wasn't on the calendar, the stuff that came your way that was unexpected. But it'll be the Lord who walks with you every step of the way. And in all the things, whether they're known or unknown, it's about, Lord Jesus, can I know you better? We're going to start a new series today. And it's a series of sermons that will stretch through to the summer. We're going to read together John's Gospel. We're going to spend time. Now, if you've, I, I, some of you know this because we've written it out on newsletters and things. So you kind of know what we're doing. I and mean, you perhaps know why we're doing it. I was impressed again by C.S. Lewis in one of his last books in the Narnia series called The Last Battle. And he talked about this idea of life being one where we're constantly, in a sense, responding to that invitation, come further up, come further in. And John's gospel does just that. I want John's gospel to be our guide to walking through the first half of the year at least, with Jesus. I want John to be the writer who provokes us to know Jesus better. And there's a sense in which for 
someone like me talking to someone like you, I'm looking around at you going, you've known Jesus for decades, some of you. And yet, there's still an ache and a cry in our hearts of, I want to know you better. I want to know you better. So my hope is that as we read it together, it will help us to know Jesus better. But more than that, I'm kind of hoping that as we read it together, we'll find ways of learning how to pray it. So it's not just information, but somehow we'll pray this gospel and we'll enter into the gospel. We'll see ourselves in that story. We'll hear God speak to us and we'll see Jesus at work around us. One of the things that all preachers find, and it's, 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 it's constantly uh, one of the things that kind of mystifies me, but I appreciate the most, is we all hear this stuff differently. Because we are different, because we're, we're starting from different moments, because we've got different experiences. But if our hearts are open, the promise is he will speak. If our hearts are open, he will speak. And some of us are going, God, I'm, I think spiritually I'm going deaf. I seem to miss too much. Lord, open my ears that I might hear again and know what you're saying. So we begin our adventure with John by reading together from the beginning. And Judith, if you'd come. John chapter 1. Verses 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace, in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Thank you. That's uh, that's John's Christmas story. (laughs) That's how he begins his gospel. Why did, why did John write his gospel? Well, at the end of his gospel, John explains why he wrote his gospel. And he said this. Jesus told 
Thomas. It's at the end of the story when Thomas, who's the doubting, unbelieving disciple, comes and finally realizes that Jesus is resurrected. Jesus said to him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who've not seen and yet have believed. That's you and me. Jesus performed many of the signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John's Gospel, as many of you know, the final gospel to be written that was included in in the Bible. Um, so in terms of the sort of chronology of how the New Testament was put together, the first writings that were kept were the letters from Paul to Christians who'd heard the story about Jesus. And Paul is writing letters to them to try and help them understand how do you live out this gospel in a culture that is pagan, that hasn't heard of Jesus How do you sort of hold the line, as it were? Those were the earliest documents that were written to New Testament Christians. Then the other Gospels were written, Mark, Matthew and Luke, probably in that sort of order. They were written later by uh, Gospel writers who wanted to make sure that you held on to the stories of Jesus for the next generation. John was later than that. So John would know that all of this material was circulating. He would know the letters of Paul. He would know about the other Gospels. He would know there were many stories of Jesus' healings. But John says, I'm writing my Gospel and I'm writing it differently. So therefore, if even a cursory look at the Gospels, you know that Matthew, Mark and Luke feel quite similar. They record similar types of stories. But you get to the book of John and it's very different. John decides, I'm going to approach this story of Jesus differently because I'm aiming for something different. I'm aiming for people who already know the stories of Jesus, but I want them to see deeper. I'm writing to people who are Christians, but I want them to trust more. He says at the end of that little passage, I'm writing this that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Different manuscripts, early manuscripts, have a slight difference. And the difference is, this is too technical for you to worry about, probably. But there's an S that's included in some words for believe that other manuscripts don't. And the difference between the S is this. For some, it was, I'm writing this so you might believe. Or it might be, and if you've got a Bible in front of you, it might have a footnote that says, I'm writing this so you might continue to believe. Both are really important. I'm writing, I want to tell you the story of Jesus that you might trust him. But what I find really encouraging is John saying, I'm writing this story that you will continue trusting Jesus. That you will continue to believe that he's the king. That you will continue to believe that Jesus coming changed everything. So for you that have been Christians for decades... Will you reread this passage that you might continue to believe? And the other thing that John tells you is there's loads. This is a very rough paraphrase. There's loads I could have told you about Jesus. I've decided not to do that. In fact, John decides, I'll tell you about seven miracles. Jesus did loads. In fact, in another part of that passage, uh, John will say, of course, there was so much that all the books in the world couldn't contain all that Jesus said. I mean, brilliant exaggeration. I'm just going to tell you about seven. But the seven miracles that I'm going to tell you about, they're going to point to some really deep stuff that you might believe. Jesus said loads, but I'm going to tell you about seven particular things that he says about himself. 
That if you can trust what Jesus says about himself and you follow him, it'll change things for you. John, in his gospel, has got a real particular concern. What happened? What did it mean for a generation of people who were rereading the story? Not people who were there at the time, but people who were being told about what happened. In the middle of John's gospel, he's going to tell us that the work of the Spirit is to remind you and guide you and lead you into all truth. How does the Spirit do that? Well, there's sometimes, I think, where the Spirit will just nudge you. And it'll be like a feeling. I think I should do this or that. And I think the longer you go with Jesus, the more you become alert to the nudges that God gives you. And one of the things I'd want to say, kind of like in brackets, is for those of you that have those experiences, trust them. Those of you that are experienced Christians, trust those feelings. Because it may well be that that's how God speaks to you. But the other way that the Spirit guides us and leads us into truth is you reread the Gospels. I'm hoping that most of us, at least from time to time, on our own, get out our Bibles and we're just reading them. And, and when that happens to us, I think everybody who does that goes, I've never really seen that before. Do you have that experience? I've never really seen that before. I've got a Bible that I use at home, and I, I've told you about this before. It's a Bible that I can't take out of the house. I can't really. It's a Bible I can't actually read on my knee. I have to read it at the desk, because if I read it on my knee, it just falls apart. I've been reading that one Bible for about 45 years now. And it's written in, and it's underlined, and it's torn, and it's got so much sellotape. It's only the sellotape holding the thing together. I nearly lost Revelation at one point, but rescued it. And that's the Bible I read most, well, every morning. And I'm still reading that same book, going, I don't know if I've ever seen that before. And I'm hearing the Lord speak to me. How does the Spirit guide us? The nudges, the rereading. John was writing for an early church. And he expected that the early church, these early Christians, in a culture that wasn't Christian, that they would be open to the Spirit, that they would hear God speak, that they would be led by him, they would be alert to him, they would be led into truth, they'd be able to love each other, they'd be able to stand, that they would be able to follow Jesus. Who will guide you this year into the unknown? The one who called you so many years ago. He will guide you. He will lead you. So let me just say three things. Just highlight three of the things. If you're part of a group, a house group, you'll get the chance to reread this and go into more detail and appreciate the nuances of it all. These first verses, they're like an overture to an orchestral piece. They introduce all the themes that John's going to play with all the way through his gospel. But the first thing he says is, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And if you've never come across any biblical writings before, you're going, well, what's he talking about now? It sounds too abstract. But this idea that he's playing with is an echo of the very first verses in the Old Testament. In the beginning was God. And God, sort of the spirit of God, hovered over the chaos. And God spoke and said, let there be light. And so John says, let me tell you about how Jesus fits into that. Let me tell you about God's word for eternity. Let me tell you that just as when creation story was being written, the pinnacle of that story was Adam and Eve being created. Let me tell you that the pinnacle of the story I want to tell you now is that Jesus came and dwelt amongst us. The revelation of God 
the word of God is being worked out in the life of Jesus. The world was created through Jesus. The world was held by him. And Jesus and the Father are one. We'll get loads of time to talk about all of those themes, but just let me highlight two things. Firstly, the universe, John says, is a safe place because it's held by God. One of the things that a few of us have talked about over the last weeks and months have been about conspiracy theories. And particularly, perhaps, for younger people, conspiracy theories are, are a big deal. I wonder whether be, it, it, they've become more significant for particularly teenagers because they've lost the Christian story. The idea of a conspiracy theory is there's someone out there controlling it, but they're doing it malignant, malignly. They're doing it for bad reasons. And you can't trust anybody, therefore. The Christian story is this. There's someone who has his hand on the universe and he's only for good. The conspiracy theories say you've got, you can't trust anybody. It's all going to end up bad. The Christian story says there's one you can trust. You'll be fine. The universe, John says, is a safe place. Because God holds it and Jesus is the word of the Father. Number one. Number two, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word came and lived amongst us. And it's a really simple thing to say. But God is Jesus-shaped. God is Jesus-shaped. If you know what God's like, look at Jesus. The things that Jesus did are the things that God values. The things that Jesus did and the people that Jesus spent time with are the things that God values. So this world that's held by God is a God who's Jesus-shaped. The word became flesh and blood and pitched his tent amongst us. Or... That's just a literal way of saying the, the word became flesh and lived amongst us, but pitched his tent. God became flesh and lived with us. So when we read John's gospel, what we're going to see, we're going to see Jesus involved with people who feel shame, with people who've got long-term illness, with people who are grieving, with people who are hungry, with people who are fearful. We're just going to see Jesus involved in conversations with authorities when the authorities think they've got all the power and the control of things, but they're frightened. And Jesus isn't going to be involved in those conversations in this gospel because God came in Jesus and stepped into our mess. So when we're going to read the gospel, we're going to listen to the way Jesus talks to people who feel ashamed and fearful. And at least some of us in the room will go, do you know what? I know that feeling. And I need to hear that word. Some of us, when we get to the passages that talk about people who've got long-term illness, are going to hear Jesus speak to them. And we're going to go, I know that. And I need to hear that. And when we get to a time when Jesus grieves for the death of a friend, we're going to go, I know those tears. Jesus stepped into our shoes. He came and made his life here in the mess that we live in. Sometimes, do you ever wonder, if I had a better family, I think I'd be a better Christian. Do you ever, does that thought ever go through your mind? <laughs> or if I had a better job, or if my, if I lived somewhere a little bit less frenetic, or if I was younger, or if I was more gifted, or if I were someone else, or if I'm married, if I were married to, anyway. 
I don't. <laughs> Do you ever, those thoughts go through your head? If things were different around me, I think I could be different. John's gospel will not let us go down that path. John's gospel says, listen, we've all got our messes. And Jesus doesn't say, I'll get rid of your mess. He comes and enters into the mess with us. And he does something creative. To none of this, if we just had lived somewhere else or if we had a better government or a better job or if our lives weren't so humdrum, John would just say to us, forget it. The word became flesh and blood. Felt the same emotions, felt the same concerns, felt what we feel. So when I pray, Jesus, I'm really dot, 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 anxious about what's going to happen. I'm really nervous. I'm really scared. I'm not sure, Jesus, how I'm going to manage. Jesus is not sitting somewhere in some celestial ivory tower going, well, just get over it. If you believed in me, you'd be fine. You must be rubbish because you've not got enough faith, have you? Jesus goes, I stood with you. I know how it feels. When the writer to the Hebrews is trying to encourage people to keep on following Jesus, he says, he is able to sympathize with our weakness because he shared our weakness. And when we get tempted, ironically, the longer you've been a Christian, the more you want to, not own up to it. The writer of Hebrews goes, he was tempted like you are. Those sexual thoughts, that idea of, can I get my own way? The idea of, can I get enough money? All those awful thoughts that go through your mind from time to time. Jesus stood in our shoes and he felt the same. He was tempted in every way that we are tempted. So when you pray, he goes, I know how it feels. And I'll show you the way out. He pitched his tent and came into the mess with us and among us. And then finally, the end of that passage that Judith read was this, that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one's ever seen God. John says, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father has made him known. John says, we spent time with Jesus and we have seen his glory and the grace and truth that he comes with. To those of us who feel guilty. Jesus comes with grace. To those of us who wonder what God thinks of us, it's grace and grace and grace and grace. To those of us who feel, I should have got over that by now, I should have dealt with that by now, grace, grace. To those of us wondering how we're going to manage and where we're going to, which direction are we going to take forward, he goes, I'm the way and the truth, I'll show you. We've seen his glory and the glory was grace and truth. And then finally, he says, no one's ever seen God, but the son who's in the closest relationship with the father. And you know that when uh, the, the New Testament were written in Greek and therefore when you're trying to translate the New Testament, sometimes you've got to make decisions about how you try and express what's going on there. And some translations of that phrase will say, who's in the bosom of the father. And the reason we don't use that in more up-to-date versions is because it just sounds, what? But there's an interesting parallel that I'd like to leave you with, and it's this. When John writes about the Last Supper, he writes about a disciple who Jesus loved, who rested on the bosom of Jesus. 
who rested at his side, who leant against him. John opens his gospels by saying, Jesus is the one who was so close to the Father. But by the end of his gospel, he's going, and I am loved by Jesus. In the same way as Jesus was loved by the Father. Someone said, I think actually, I don't think this this phrase is by D.H. Lawrence, if you know who he was. I don't think he was writing about this gospel passage. He's writing about something else, but it's a great phrase to explain this gospel passage. This is a gospel passage that is a, the song of a man that knew he's loved. And John, when he writes his gospel, and he talks about the disciple that's beloved. He never uses his own name. And I kind of wonder if that, in some, some reason, was that you might put your name in. You're the disciple that's loved. You are the disciple that's beloved. You have a song to sing of a man or a woman who's loved. This is the glory of the beginning of John's gospel.